deep within the bowels of the British Museum is a rather unusual object. At first glance, you might assume it's just an old-fashioned telephone. However, this particular telephone has a rather peculiar aspect to it. It is said that whenever a class of especially inquisitive children have questions about the world, the telephone appears all of a sudden on the desk of a British Museum curator. We aren't quite sure where it came from or exactly how it works. All we know is that it's called the History Hotline. It's the curious question phone. This phone only appears when kids have a curious question for a curator. I bet I know why this phone came to me today. It's because I'm an Egyptologist. That's a person who studies ancient Egypt. Some Egyptologists are archaeologists. We work in modern day Egypt, digging up and then studying what the ancient people left behind, like their houses made out of mud bricks, stone statues, jewelry, and wooden furniture that looks a lot like our own beds and chairs. Other Egyptologists are philologists. This means they study what the ancient Egyptians wrote down, like letters, magical spells, math problems, and love poems. Many of these are written in beautiful hieroglyphs on stone or papyrus, which is like an ancient paper. Some Egyptologists are both archaeologists and philologists. I wonder what the questions will be about today. The ancient Egyptian civilization was around for over 3,000 years. That is a lot of ground to cover. I hope I'm ready. Oh, because here's the first one. Egypt and Suzanne's study room. Hello, I am Jessica, and I would like to ask, what are inside the rooms of the pyramid? Well, Jessica, right now, aside from a lot of very sweaty tourists, most room inside pyramids are completely empty. In some, there is a large stone coffin that we call a sarcophagus. But of course, you probably wanted to know what was originally in the rooms, right? Well, pyramids were tombs of kings, so they would have contained the mummy of the king in the sarcophagus, which was put into a special room called the burial chamber. The Egyptians believed that you could take all of your belongings with you into the afterlife, so there would have also been all the things a king would need, like beds and chairs, clothes and crowns, statue, food, drinks, games, weapons, and even more. Some pyramids even have hieroglyphs inscribed on the inside walls. These are magical special texts which help the king get to the afterlife. Today, we call them the pyramid texts. But what's really interesting is that there's actually only a few pyramids that have rooms inside of them. This is because it was super tricky to build the rooms correctly when building a pyramid. The stones weigh a lot, and if you don't build it exactly right, it can cause the ceiling to collapse. The Great Pyramid of Khufu at Giza is a good example of this. In the main burial chamber, there are special stones in the ceiling to reinforce it, but we can see that some of them are crooked or cracked. Because of how complicated it was, other kings did something that's maybe sort of cheating. They actually dug their burial chambers into the ground first and then built the pyramid on top. So technically the rooms aren't inside the pyramid, but actually underneath it. This is the British Museum. Hi, my name's Matilda, and I want to ask what happened to ordinary people when they died? That's a great question, Matilda. Many people think that all Egyptians were mummified when they died, but that's not true. The truth is that many of the ancient Egyptians who were mummified were what we call elites, which means that they were wealthy and had powerful positions, like queens or priests or generals in the army. We know this because the materials and decorations they used for their coffins and in their tombs would have cost a lot. We don't have many examples of cemeteries with non-elite Egyptians, probably because they were buried closer to their villages, and those villages are now underneath modern Egyptian cities. But based on some examples, we can guess what would have happened when these everyday Egyptians who weren't as rich died. They probably would have had a smaller burial with fewer objects, maybe just a couple of pots or some jewelry and some figurines. They might have been wrapped in linen or a mat made from reeds and buried in the desert, which would have helped to dry their bodies out naturally. Of course, they would have still had people who cared about them. So we can also guess that their family may have said prayers for them and left offerings of food or drink by their tombs. 
This is the British Museum. My name is Florence. Who started mummification and what herbs did they put in mummified bodies? You know, that's a really interesting question, Florence. The short answer to your question is, we don't actually know who exactly started mummification because nobody wrote it down. We think it was probably a slow process and that all the rituals that we associate with mummification today actually developed over a very long period of time. So it wasn't just one person who did it. Some of the earliest burials we have in Egypt didn't use mummification at all. Instead, the person was buried in a reed mat in the desert. We have the remains of some of these people, and what's really cool is that the dry sand helped to preserve their skin, their nails, and their hair. Archaeologists, specifically bioarchaeologists who study ancient people's bodies, think that it's possible that the ancient Egyptians noticed this natural mummification and decided to try to perfect it. Mummification probably became popular because ancient Egyptians believed that you needed your body to be preserved forever so that your soul could do super fun things in the afterlife, like swimming, eating tasty food, drinking water and wine, and meeting up with your friends. The Egyptians used a lot of herbs and natural things to preserve the body and to make it smell nice. This included natron salt, which dried the body out artificially. Sometimes, the abdomen was washed out with sweet-smelling spices, like frankincense and palm wine. To make your skin feel smooth after it had been dried out, juniper oil, beeswax, spices, milk, and wine could be rubbed into it. Finally, resin, which is a type of sap that comes from trees and dries hard and waterproof, could be applied to your skin or your hair. Hello, British Museum. Hello, my name is Izzy. My question is, how do you read hieroglyphics? Oh, that's a tricky one, Izzy. Hieroglyphs are quite a complicated type of script, and it takes Egyptologists many years to learn how to read them correctly. Even now, I need a dictionary a lot when I read ancient Egyptian texts. Hieroglyphs are tricky because even though they look like pictures, most of the time the meaning of the sign is not the same as the thing pictured. It's a mixed script. Some signs are alphabetic, like the letters in our alphabet. Other signs make a group of sounds, like a syllable. Still other signs are an entire word. Every once in a while, the same hieroglyph can do all three things. And sometimes hieroglyphs aren't pronounced at all. These are called determinatives. They sit at the end of a word to give us a clue to the meaning of the whole word. I'll give you a quick example using a three-word Egyptian phrase. These two signs are both words. The first one, shaped like a pair of arms, means not. And the second one, shaped like a water wave, means two or four. But they're also alphabetic. They're both the letter N. When you put them together, like this, they become the first word in our phrase, nen, which means no one. The second word in the phrase is pronounced messy. The first sign is one of those group of sound signs. It is mess. The second sign is an alphabetic sign, an S. But importantly, you don't pronounce two S's in the word. The second sign just reinforces the first one. The third sign, which comes as a pair, is also alphabetic. It's a Y. Finally, we have one of those determinative clues at the end. This shows a woman having a baby because the word means to be born. The last word in the phrase is sa. It means wise. Like messy, the word has a combination of alphabetic signs, an S and an A, and group signs, a sa, plus a silent determinative clue. In this case, the clue is a man pointing to his mouth. Many words that have to do with thoughts and emotions have this determinative. We think because the Egyptians associated them with speech. So there you go, your first hieroglyph lesson. Nen, messy, sa. No one is born wise. And it's true, you have to learn from others. Hello, British Museum. Hi, my name is Kieran. What was written on the canopic jars? Now that's a good one. I'm guessing you already know this, but just in case other people don't, canopic jars were used to store a person's organs if they were being mummified. During the mummification process, the body had to be dried out. And so they took out the lungs, liver, stomach, and intestines. Of course, you'd need these organs in the afterlife. How else would you eat all of that delicious food or breathe the fresh air in paradise? 
So these organs were also dried out, and sometimes wrapped in bandages too, just like the mummy was. Then they were put in their own containers, which we call canopic jars. For protection, there were spells that were written on the outside of the jars. They always made sure to name the person to which the organs belonged, otherwise they might get lost. The spells also called on specific gods to look after each organ. The four sons of Horus, who was god of the sky and of kingship, were special protectors of these canopic jars. The lungs were protected by Horus's son Happy, a baboon-headed god, along with the goddess Nephthys, Horus's aunt. The stomach was protected by Horus's son Duamutef, a jackal-headed god, along with the goddess of creation and war, Neith. The liver was protected by Horus's son Imseti, a human-headed god, along with the goddess Isis, Horus's mother. The intestines were protected by Horus's son Kebisenef, a falcon-headed god, along with the goddess of healing, Circuit. Department of Egypt in Sudan. Hello, my name's Heidi, and my question is, what are the bands just made of? You know, Heidi, I bet you already know the answer to this. The bandages are made out of textile, so that they're able to be cut into strips and carefully wrapped around the person's body during mummification. More precisely, the bandages were made of a type of linen from the flax plant. Interestingly, the flax plant wasn't native to Egypt. It arrived in the prehistoric period from the Levant, probably through trade or travel. The flax plant grows about a meter high and has small light blue flowers. It was harvested every year, then it was dried. The fibers were separated from the stem and then they were spun into thread. That thread was finally woven into linen. People didn't only use linen for mummy bandages though. They wore linen clothing, had linen bedding, linen bags, and linen towels. They also used linen as currency for payments. This is because Egyptians didn't have money in the form of coins or notes like we do today. Egypt and Sudan, this is Kelly. Hello, my name's Ruben. Why did Anubis have a jackal head? That is a very good question, Ruben. You're right. Anubis was often shown with a jackal head on a human body, or fully as a jackal, but almost never fully as a human. Anubis was the god of the dead and embalming, which is another word for mummification. We think that the link between Anubis and the dead came about because jackals and other types of dogs lived on the desert edge where cemeteries were located. Jackals would often scavenge for food in cemeteries, which wasn't very good news for the people buried there. But the Egyptians believed in a type of magic where a threat could be transformed into a symbol of protection. And that may be why the jackal-headed Anubis became the protector of the dead. And like magic, the telephone is gone. Who knows where the history hotline will appear next? I certainly don't. <laughs>